Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. I'm Josh Davis. Uh, Michael Freeman. And if you'd like to be a part of the discussion during our live tapings, please check us out at youtube.com slash user slash curb anarchy on Mondays at 9 p.m., 6 p.m. Pacific. And you can see our final product on the air at youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And uh, please check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash of anarchy. If you're here right now during our live taping, please uh, post any questions and comments right there on the live thread. Um, and um, you can also message us through Facebook if you uh, prefer to do that. Holly Cogburn runs Homebody, a body care, vanity, and cosmetic products company. She contracts using USD, Bitcoin, Homebody products, and fresh produce. She is proud to say that she started the business without the assistance of bank loans. In her words, fuck bank loans and fuck their interest rates. For the most part, fuck banks. She paid her costs out of pocket and has steadily and sustainably grown from there. She believes in a free, fair, and reputation-based market relying on word of mouth. So please find Holly at homebodyco, homebodyco.com or facebook.com slash homebodyco. All right, so uh, Michael, we have Luis on the show. We do, uh, Luis Fernando Mises. If if I'm saying that that right, uh, how are you doing tonight, bud? I'm great. How are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. You know, uh, it was a last second thing, so so we we really humbly thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, unfortunately, we had a change of plans. Um, Tony Bones of Cop Block was our our scheduled guest of the night, but it looks like she was having some uh, some issues with her her children's health. So, you know, best of luck to them, and 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 hope that all works out. And maybe we'll be able to get Tony back in the future. She she mentioned that probably in January we could get something going. So, anyways, so we fixed it in the last 45, 35 minutes. Uh, my buddy here, Luis, agreed to come on. Uh, who's a quite the busy activist, entrepreneur. You might know him from Emancip Emancipated Human, which is also a program on VVN, and a Facebook channel that, a Facebook page, I'm sorry, that's much more popular than any one that I've ever run, for sure. Um, but my favorite of his Facebook uh, th things that he's running is Black Markets Are Beautiful, because they are. You know, I'm a big fan of things like Silk Road and, and Pirate Bay, so. So, uh, Luis, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I usually like to start this off by asking, how did you find uh, individual liberty? Um, it was, um, I think I, I am going to blame uh, my parents, first <laughs> of all. Um, and that's, that's kind of uh, the honest truth, you know, because they always told me uh, basically the whole uh, adage of uh, um, don't start any problems, but you know, but at the same time, if somebody does something to you, you're going to defend yourself. And so, you know, I mean, you know, basically the golden rule and as, um, as I, you know, just kept reading and like, um, learning and studying, I, I found, um, Ron Paul, Tom Woods, um, Jeff Berwick, Jeffrey Tucker, and all those guys, um, Doug Casey. And, uh, it was pretty clear to me that uh, the stuff that I was conjuring up in my head, somebody had already thought about it and had it in words and writing and books and YouTube videos for a while. So I was just, uh, I, I, it just was a normal and natural click for me and I fell in love with it. And um, it, um, it also had to do some with uh, part of uh, my spiritual awakening um, I'm also um, in, I'm also a yoga instructor and a meditation teacher and uh, like all that was related with liberty. So um, that's how it started. How would you? Um, I've never heard that before. Yoga, yoga and liberty. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that there is um, uh, yoga is. It's the path of liberation, basically to quiet your mind and just enter in a place of no mind where you are one 
and you're free and you're peaceful and you're blissful. So um, through the blows of the asanas, as you're moving in, you become totally free. Uh, uh, the well, asanas are the asanas are, are the positions, the yoga postures. So you know, like um, after a while, you you you're able to. Um, I mean, if you do it constantly, I mean, it's not like for uh, weakened warriors by any means, but um, uh, it really helps you concentrate your focus, and it helps you see that, um, you know, after, you know, so many years of meditation, and helps you see that your reality is kind of, or in other words, reality is like an inkblot test. Whatever you see in an inkblot test is what you see, but that's not what, somebody else can see and at the same time so um, you know and then again bringing my parents whatever what they told me is like you know whatever you like it's not what they like so just let them do whatever as long as you don't hurt others so again you know it goes back to the whole voluntarist idea great so I mean that's kind of where it comes from okay um, and that's 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 beautiful I, I can't personally relate to exactly your story um, and this may be surprising to some people JB in particular I'm I've, I've been considering things like yoga meditation um, I don't know if you guys can tell but I'm a pretty high-strung guy and I have a lot of trouble calming down and, and well a anyways I've been considering it and I might talk to you in the future about it right that's the whole I think point. it will be pretty helpful yeah I'm sorry sir no, no, that's that's what I was saying. Yeah, it's just um, it calms you down, uh, de-stresses you, and actually, I should I should think that it you know pushes out negative emotion, not necessarily positive. So, I mean, I I do have my my certain ways of of calming down already. Right, right. But yeah, well, I don't want to say that it pushes away the negative stuff. In fact, it's pro probably the opposite. It stirs up all the shit that's inside of you, and it makes you face it. It makes you look at it. So it's kind of like a catharsis. It's kind of like, uh, um, you know, doing a lot of shadow work from Carl Jung. Uh, it, it allows you to bring awareness to the darkness inside of you. So um, basically, that's basically what enlightenment is. You become aware so when you're able to do that, you know, you see that, you know, you become less judgmental because you, you, you realize that you have a lot of shit inside of you as well. And, and then you focus on working on that. And as you're working on yourself, which is the individual path, then you're able to help others as you're going through it. So it's kind of like being, it, the word would be interdependence. Like you're extremely independent, but you also realize that you're dependent on others. So you work with others and it's just kind of like anarchy. It's the uh, spontaneous order that takes place through um, going inward. So it's about empathy and um, maybe mm, so less about uh, the mind. Well, no, I'm I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm very wrong. No, I don't think you're wrong. Um, I think it's <coughs> it's it's not necessarily deciding between one or the other. It's yeah. actually you know like I. When I was um, in college, the uh, religions professor, which I'm not religious by any means, but, and this is kind of, anyway, so I saw the, some video that he showed us from uh, uh, the Ring of Fire in Indonesia. So one of these guys was saying, you know, the way you, that you become an entire person is by bringing your positive self and your negative self and marrying them, and then you become one. And then, so you have the brain and you have the feel, and then you have the awareness and... I mean, there's more than what you can see. You know, the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes can see is so minimal. Like, what what our brains do, they um, they distort, delete, and generalize information. So you basically get a very small percentage of what's out there. Mm -hmm. So uh, by you know becoming aware of these things, and I mean anything, you can do anything. But that's basically what um, propelled me to the individual path of anarchy and uh, live and let live. You know, like. This awareness allows me to see that, okay, that person's working on that, and I am not going to piss in their parade because that's what they're working on. That's a reality. So I'm just going to drink my beer, do my thing, <laughs> do my work, and, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that, Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. That's really my philosophy as well. Um, 
I find myself stuck in, in isms very often, but I, I, I try not to use specific ones. Um, if I was to choose one, it would be abolitionists, really. Uh, but, you know, earlier where you say you use meditation and, and uh, yoga to find, um, I'm going to paraphrase here, but to understand the evil inside of you or the, the bad stuff you carry, right? And that's not even a problem that I have at all. I know exactly what, what bad stuff is inside of me. I, um, what I'm just going for is more of holistic, you know, I have anxiety issues, right? And there's an argument to be made for alcohol and, and, and cannabis that they help that, but <laughs> there's another argument to be made there too. So I'm looking for ways that I can relax and, and keep my, my brain in check without having to go to the VA and get amped up on Ambien, Celexa, and, and Benzos, you know. Yeah, that's not so, good. So that leads us into this... Uh, I was going to save this more towards the end, but the conversation goes exactly where it's need to. A great thinker once said... <laughs> Um, so w w what are your spiritual beliefs? You mentioned that you're, you are not religious. Yeah, I, I think that um, religion is a little bit like government. It uh, wants to claim monopoly of truth. So, you know, this is the true path, this is the true way. And so I guess the spiritual beliefs uh, that I have is basically the, the latest realization that I've come with is that the most spiritual part of life is the most physical part of life. So being here, being now, action, you know, wishing for stuff is not going to do anything. <laughs> we have to do. And, you know, I mean, with all the respect, a ton of prayers is not going to feed people. You have to go out and do it. And there's a lot of people that do that, and that there's a lot of value there. Now, um, I think that it's just basically awareness. That's that's um, my spiritual belief. <laughs> that's yeah. groovy. I mean, that sounds rational to me, and I don't say that about about faith very very often. Um, you know, I I chalk it up to intentions, which I do pretty often with even cops or veterans or military or whatever. Um, prayer is good intentions, you know, and that, that's great. If you want to think and hope that something good happens to somebody, whether it's feeding the poor or getting rid of a flood or whatever it is, that's, that's fantastic and I appreciate your concern, but that's just a, an intention. That's just a, something that you want to happen. It's not an action. And if you want the poor to not starve, you should feed them. If you want to protect people in a flood, you should, I don't know, set up sandbags and help evacuate people or whatever it is, donate food, whatever. Um, so yeah, I just, as I always do, I chalk that one up to intentions. I don't really care what you think. I don't really care what, what you hope happens. I care what you do about it. Um, I'd yeah. like to be the devil's advocate for a second. Um, <laughs> I was brought up a Christian. And uh, I, I don't consider myself anymore, honestly. But I, I think that um, I was taught that uh, God doesn't help <clears throat> God doesn't help anyone that doesn't help themselves. Exactly. Um, right. But uh, and that's that's at least the Christian belief. Um, but a lot of people really do put maybe a bit too much. Hope into prayer. Now, I believe that prayer is actually a good thing, and it brings about a spiritual um, something spiritual within oneself. Hey, if, if it um, makes you feel, if it makes you feel good, right? It does help, um, and it's not just of oneself. It makes you feel like you're going to, um, you know, it 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 brings a sense of community. Um, I think. And uh, it actually does bring about action eventually. But um, 
so I think there's something to it, uh, to prayer, but not, yeah, you have to uh, act. You're right. You, you have to actually do something about something. You Use whatever, whatever coping, coping mechanisms make you feel good. You know, I have a, a few myself. If it's <laughs> prayer, if it's coffee, that's great. I don't care. But don't think that your help – that's one thing I really don't like. You know, I'm, a, I'm an anti-theist. I'm, I'm, I'm against religion. I'm not just opposed to the – I'm not just – I don't not just uh, um, prescribe to it. But, but then again, I think like – okay, I, I understand and I agree with what you said. Um, I have probably, you know, a handful of friends that are considered Christian – that they actually do despise religion as well, but they do. Um, actually, I would. They do follow the actual teachings of Jesus, which is basically the golden rule, which is to me libertarianism, which well, I respect I immensely. I understand that there is an argument to be made for Jesus being an anarchist. To be to yeah. be quite honest, I understand that there's an argument to be made. I'm not saying that I agree or disagree. I have not done my. Uh, my due diligence on that one, and I probably won't. I'm not honestly overly interested in it. Um, but yeah, I know some some people who consider themselves Christian anarchists who who are very cool, and they're not going to be pointing guns at me to force me to believe in their gods and or ideas or anything like that. So that's fine. I might make fun of them a little bit, but I'm not going to ostracize them for it. Right. I, I think. I think what we're trying to describe is the difference between religion and spirituality. Is that what we're getting at here? No, uh, I guess we were just kind of like doing a little bit of mental masturbation on, on what spirituality <laughs> is. But um, I, uh, um, you know, just I guess we can, I don't, I think that religion is kind of a, a cancerous cell that prevents people from growing. Yeah. Um, and basically, you know, like even in the teachings, religion of, definitely holds back innovation. That that is for sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh, oh, this is hilarious. Uh, one of my cousins, he lives in North Carolina, and in, in the Bible Belt, in the, you know, Western North Carolina, and he was saying, you know, 20 years ago, this was so empty, and everybody was poor and suffering, and you know, it was like extremely religious. But then they started bringing like breweries and like a little bit of lap dance places and all that <laughs> stuff and it started becoming effervescent like people were no longer in poverty so yeah. I think you know the free market is it's a powerful force that can be used for good it can be used for um, I mean obviously it's a tool are they gonna like you know the, is the government gonna hack it and you know do what it's doing or are we gonna take you know I think Jeffrey Tucker said it really nicely it, it, the important thing is uh, the interaction being between the one that pays and the ones that receive the money. The further that separates, you know, the more um, toxic it becomes. So, you know, right. back to the idea of the free market and like no regulations and just allowing people, I mean, how many people wake up in the morning saying, I'm going to fuck you over and I'm going to keep your money, you know, like, I mean. I don't know a single person that's not a government agent. You know. <laughs> Um, Pareto's law, law talks about 80-20, you know, 80% 80 of the population are nice, well-intended people. And the other 20% may have a little bit of a shady intentions, but they may not act on them, you know, unless, you know, they become government agents or something like that. But, you know, for the most part, most people are nice. Yeah, there, there's a common argument, well, it's not an argument, it's a fallacy, to be honest, but... It's, uh, State supporters and nationalists will often say, well, without government, there would be chaos. People would be rioting in the streets and breaking into my house, stealing my cat, whatever. The fact of the matter is, I don't know a single person in my life who would do any of those things. And mo anybody that I ask that question to generally tells me the exact same thing, that no, they don't know anybody who's going to do that. So where is this mass c collective of looters, rioters, and rapers. Where are they? I don't know, but I like what that makes me believe is that those people that fear it is because they themselves need to be babied around, you know, like they, like, 
I need government because otherwise I will run into you know such and such house or I'll kick somebody's ass or something. Exactly. You know, I mean, I don't care. I try it. You know, I'm like I have a weapon at almost every corner of my house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Like, um, people don't have the mental capacity to actually see that we don't really need a government. We, no. you know, we're beyond that. We really are. Um, you know, if we were just left alone, I over the course of time, we, it would become archaic, this whole idea of the state. Worst case scenario, the worst thing that I'm going to do is lay in bed and smoke too much weed. <laughs> who, who am I hurting there? So I'm not going to be burning anything down or throwing any Molotov cocktails. Yeah, and the worst I'll be doing is playing too many board games. <laughs> like, and Magic the Gathering, maybe. That's Talk fine. A little too much. You know, um, I think um, Doug Casey, um, he just wrote the uh, foreword for uh, Market for Liberty in Spanish, and he said, uh, gov some people think that government is what keeps us from going back to the jungle, but in reality is what keeps us from going to the stars. And I think that that's, like, so right on. And I'm Where so we're going, predicted. we don't need roads. Exactly. <laughs> Speaking of in Spanish, um, and this was just news to me tonight. I did not know this until 25 minutes ago. You host Anarchast, and if you guys don't know Anarchast, there's this, this liberty entrepreneur named Jeff Berwick who runs a, a show and podcast called Anarchast. He runs... A, a website called the Dollar Vigilante. He's a he's a very busy guy. I'm sure anybody listening to our show knows who he is. Right. So Luis here um, does the the Espanol version of Anarchast, and I, I did not even know that existed. You want to give us a little rundown? Yeah, and uh, we basically just started a few months ago, and I've only done like I I've only done probably like four or five. Um, you know, um, episodes and that, um, and I try to do once a month. It's kind of hard to get to uh, so many. You know, I have a lot of things going on too. But so uh, basically, what we do is um, just trying to bring a lot of the uh, ideas and a lot of people and like the examples in Spanish because there's a need for that as well. Um, Absolutely. You know, and what's funny is that in my, you know, in Anarchists in Spanish, I get minimum of 300 views. So, like, people want it. They're devouring it. You know, like, I, anywhere from 300 to, I think, 2,700. So, I mean, that's, and I've only have, like, I told you, five, you know. I there, think so. South America could use some, could use some Anarchists. They could use some more liberty down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we're working on it, and on, I'm, I'm working with uh, Jeff Berwick, as you mentioned. He's, he's a pretty amazing guy, and, and he's so humble. Um, you know, I, I got to interview him not long ago, and I was like, you know, how, how the hell do you do all these things? You're such a high-performing individual. And he's like, I don't, I don't do all this. I mean, I, I'm not <laughs> high-performing. I'm just playing. I'm always on vacation. I'm, I'm always working. And I'm like... Oh my God, like all the projects that we do together, and that's only a percentage of that I get to collaborate <laughs> with him. Yeah, so Jeff, things... um, he's drunk like 80% of the time. He basically has the life that I'm going for. <laughs> he drinks and does freedom stuff and plays with computers and buys nice cameras and hangs out in South America on, in basically a resort. Yeah, that's what I'm going for, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know what? Let's come back. Let's... I want to I want to touch on Anarchapoco. Uh, Anarchapoco. Did it right? um, I did. Yeah. Okay. There's an event this February, I believe, down at near Jeff's house in the area around his house and on the beach, I believe, uh, called Anarchapoco. Or you can also look up Anarchopoco. I think he he has both domains, and they'll they'll redirect to you. You can look it up on on Google or you know whatever to find it, and it's. Basically, a pork fest on the beach, from what I understand. This is the first year, so it's it's going to be toned down, and, and if it goes well, I'm sure it should explode. Um, I'm aware that Luke Rudowski of We Are Change is going to be there, uh, Objectivist Girl, 
from New Hampshire up there. Some of you guys might know her. Um, I think she's a free stater. But anyways, I guess Luis is going to be attending that. So why don't and you're in Jeff's pocket. So why don't you tell us about it? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm paying my own way down, so not oh. quite in his pocket. But <laughs> I'm just kidding, <laughs> Jeff. I'm just kidding. Um, he, he's such a nice guy. Anyway, oh, so yeah, he's cool. he's what cool. um, what he said was, um, you know. Uh, what he finds humorous is that most of these freedom fests happen to be in one of the least free free uh, places in the world, right. you know. Um, and you see, I'm from Mexico, so I'm um, I can you know I've basically lived half of my life in one place, half of my life in the other. So, you know, here when we go to festivals and whatnot, at two a.m. they kick you out, um, you know, and you're basically oh, not the festivals I go to, dude. Okay, well, okay, that's that's probably a good point. But, you know, <laughs> you, for the most part, aside from privately owned festivals, like if it's like a, like a business, you know, they kick you out of two and whatever. And over there, okay, so here, what was it, March, we were at the Bitcoin conference in uh, Austin. And oh, you I was with, Yeah, I, I was with... Are you I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I guess I, I'll, I'll have to um, ask my wife if she lets me go. <laughs> oh, sorry, um, sorry. No, ru no rulers, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, uh, they kicked us out of two, and we have, like, our slice of pizza as we're trying to get a cab, and, like, some dudes, basically, like, some police officers, like, I mean, I'm 5'9", so these guys were, like, 6'2", six, 6'3", six, <laughs> and Jeff is tall. He's, like, 6'1", six, 6', yeah. six, probably, and so these dudes are, like, way taller than us and, like, 300 pounds, like, super muscular, and they push us to the freaking... Uh, um, sidewalk and we were just basically getting a cab so like these dudes are accosting us just because we're trying to like jaywalking and it's for our safety right <laughs> yeah. so what he says is like that's you armed? no uh well my my weapon was in my car so okay. um I, I yeah i mean if i'm drinking i'm not gonna be yeah, I, yeah. My gun. um and we were a little bit tipsy but anyway <laughs> so you know transfer that to acapulco and the beach and, you know, like, if you're kind of tipsy and you happen to, like, trip, the police officers will pick you up, kind of, like, do this on your clothes and get you on your way. You know, I mean, I've walked in the main street of Acapulco with, like, several hundred dollars in my pocket, like, at 3, 4, 5 a.m. and drunk, and nothing has ever happened to me. None of that stuff. Like, I don't fear for my life like I would, you know, back in, down in Austin. Dude, yeah. this was the hor most horrible thing that happened. 2.30 2 a.m., we know we're walking to my car, and we were drunk. We couldn't find my car. So there's, uh, you know, they're remodeling part of uh, Austin, and, like, some dudes, like, crawling because they were so drunk. Like, people that are not allowed to be drinking, you know, suddenly, like, they were like zombies crawling out. Like, imagine, it's like 3 a.m., all dark, in ruins because it's being under construction and suddenly people crawling and vomiting making rolling noises <laughs> and I don't have my gun with me part. yeah so we're like what the hell so anyway so moving down to paradise so that's what he's trying to accomplish being in a festival free fest where there's actual freedom yeah right on. What, be what better place to have alright I can't lie I'm looking into New Hampshire um, not exactly with the free state project but there are some other organizations that I'm with you, Michael. I'm with you. But New Hampshire is covered in snow seven, eight months out of the year, and that doesn't seem appealing to me at all. So, what better place to have in Kapistan than on a beautiful in 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 resort land where I can crawl out of rubble drunk and have nothing bad happen to me? Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of people fear that, you know, for instance, I think I was reading that Acapulco was the fourth most dangerous city in the world. And, you know, my mom, my mom is 70 years old, and she goes every summer to Acapulco for a week with her two sisters. Wow. Every year. And nothing ever happens to them, you know. <laughs> and, like, you see, like, three old ladies just kind of roaming around Acapulco, you know, going to have dinner and some drinks and, like, and nothing. And then when I go there... You know, nothing happens. So what happens is, like, Ac Acapulco is actually extremely safe. And it's, like, the surrounding little towns that may be a little bit shady. So as long as you stick in Acapulco, you'll be fine. 
all right, I feel like we need to plug this again after after this conversation. So, <laughs> so that's anarchopolco or anarchopolco.com. You can find Jeff and Luis at um, thedollarvigilante.com on Anarchast, which is a podcast, YouTube show, and, and Anarchast in Espanol, apparently. Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, so Jeff, when you watch this, we really want you to be our guest. February... <laughs> The last Monday in February. Close it out for us, bud. Yeah. We we encourage drinking. Yes. <laughs> um, right, so, so yeah, we can we can go over the currency if you wish to just yeah do it up. I could I All could right, definitely take my break. Yeah, this will be about a minute. So uh, last time we did this show uh, was December fifteenth. Uh, tonight we're live uh, December twenty second. Took these prices at 8:39 tonight. Uh, last time silver was 16.18. Tonight it is 15.69, so it went down about 50 cents. That's a 3% drop. Gold last time was 11.96.58. It's dropped about 20 bucks to 11.78.02. That's 1.6%. Uh, and Bitcoin went from 344.15 to 331. 15, that's a $13 change, it's 3.8%. Not uh, a big difference, uh, except there, silver and gold went down pretty heavily quickly uh, today. Um, so that's probably why we see the big difference. Um, in any case, silver, um, I, again, I haven't been buying, but... Um, yeah, I'll be buying into Bitcoin. Um, I've been talking with Michael uh, to get into Bitcoin, uh, trying to learn the ins and outs. And, um, yeah, just want to get into real liberty because I've been talking about silver and gold. I buy silver and gold, but Bitcoin, you know, hey, it's the other, it's the other currency or the other, not hard money, but it's... Uh, it seems to uh, be in line with silver and gold and the, um, the process of mining it and that whole idea. Um, the algorithms uh, don't seem to have been broken over the last year or something. So no real problems with Bitcoin. Um, I just think the only way uh, Bitcoin can really die down is if... Um, you know, there's not enough silver and gold to uh, put into the, you know, the cell phones and the laptops. So, it, I don't know. It, it's just uh, an interesting, um, an interesting idea, I guess. Bitcoin, do, Luis. What do you think of Bitcoin? I assume you have Bitcoin. Yes, and uh, as you were talking about that, I was looking to see if it went up or down or what. Right. Um, I, oh, I do. Yeah, I'm. I'm looking at my uh, my wallet. It went yeah. up a little bit, um, okay. which is nice, just a tiny bit, and that's pretty wonderful. And I think that it went down a little bit because you know there was a lot of um, like a lot of people taking it, but there was not. There's, it's an interesting thing. We can talk about that later. But, I mean, I did lose a little bit, but now it seems like it's going back up. Um, I just wish that like TXU took Bitcoin, you know, like my electric company and AT and T took Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, Microsoft is taking it now, so that's kind of cool. And I actually uh, did a, well, I didn't do it. I one of my friends did um, an article on it, and we posted it on Emancipated Humans. So that's that's pretty interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Um, about a year ago, uh, casinos started taking it in Vegas. I know that because I'm into gambling, but um, yeah, uh, casino. Well, just two of them, and it's owned by the same guy. But um, things might have changed over the last year. I haven't heard about it. Um, so yeah, it's it's slowly creep, creeping into the mainstream. Um, I don't know why I'm taking so long to really get into Bitcoin, except I do have just this simple argument against it. It's not an elemental metal. I, I, that's all. That's the only argument against it. It's not a really valid. Well, it's a valid argument, but it's not that's a. It's not, not an argument. 
It's not. It, it, yes, it is. <laughs> what is? What's why? Why? Why is it a problem that it's not a precious metal? Uh, this goes back to the whole idea of. Do we really want to do this again? Do you have dollars in your pocket? Right, I have dollars in my pocket. Right, they're not backed by gold. No, they're not. <laughs> so right, but the the reason against fiat currency is because it's used uh, in aggression with, by the state. It's forced upon the market. This this particular fiat currency, yes. But see, Bitcoin Most is backed by its usefulness and by the fact that it's like P2P and a blockchain. Right. So that's what gives value to it. And I mean, obviously, everything that we give value to comes from our brain. But I mean, even if you just buy a little bit as a form of like having fun, you know, it may make <laughs> you some money later on. Everybody who comes on the show tells him this. We we know. Don't buy Bitcoin. <laughs> um, but but the fact of the matter. The fact of the matter is, speaking definitively, Bitcoin is a fiat currency. No, it's not. No, Bitcoin is not a fiat currency. It's not declared by the Congress. What is it backed by? Physically backed by? It's not backed by anything. Right. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, okay. Um, but anyways, as Luis is saying, you know, like on the first or whatever, I'll throw you like ten bucks. And then take that and go to Amagi Metals and buy some silver and just and then the next time we have the show, tell me how good that felt. Oh yeah, no, I, I will definitely be do doing that. Yeah. So tell us about your show, Luis. You have a show on VVN as well, right? Yeah, I posted. Um, I have my YouTube channel, Emancipated Human, and then I also posted in the Voluntary Virtues Network. Um, I only do it every other week because, dude, this, like, as you guys know, it takes a while, you know, like setting up the um, shows and then doing the shows and then editing. And then, I mean, you have to do your normal work, so it's kind of hard. So I only do it every other week. And um, this past time I was um, actually doing an event on boundaries, intimacy, and sex with my tantric teacher. Um, well, then. Just, um, I guess, you know, see, the thing with my, my uh, show is um, I, I try to bring practical examples because there's a lot of um, theory that has been talked about. And theory is beautiful, but I, I, I really like to bring practical examples, things that people can watch and run away with. So, you know, how can their life become freer? So, for instance, you know, sexuality is one of the things that people are really... Uh, trapped in, you know, like, and the way my tantric teacher, uh, Kendall, talks about it is the difference between having fast food sex or gourmet sex. Um, and before that, I had Doug Casey, which, I mean, he's he's my hero. Um, we can tell. Well, we talked about <laughs> we talked about uh, some awesome things, and um, we posted on the website as well. And um, I mean, I guess that that's. That's all I have to say about that. I mean, is that does that answer the question? Um, no. <laughs> I mean, tantric teaching sounds like a a really swell time and all, but uh, you know, I mean, I think I maybe I do understand. You want to use more realistic means to utilize um, voluntary association anarchism in your day to day life and. Oh yeah, and for instance, I mean, I had another guy that he has, he's running an eco village, you know, a mile and a half away from my house. He has several acres, and he got raided by SWAT team in Arlington. And I went and met with him, and um, you know, we dis we discussed about what he does, you know, like how he's able to, you know, like the crops that he grows, and you know, like basically what people can do to do that. And um, I've also talked to, um, uh, let me just look here real quick. Oh yeah, uh, Jake Shannon. He's he's a Discordian, and if you don't know what Discordia means, just Google Discordianism. Uh, I, I would consider myself a Discordian, and so basically, he's a hypnotist, and he gives uh, hints of uh, how you can make a better life, and how uh, hypnotism is really not like some mumbo jumbo stuff. It's something. It's basically words, 
you know, like the way he describes it is like when you're reading a book and you get really into like the world dissolves, you know, that you're being hypnotized. So anyway, um, other things that I've um, had on the show and, you know, Jeff Berwick and then Corey Watkins, which is, oh, Cody, uh, Cody Drummond from uh, Peacekeepers. Uh, Corey Watkins, which uh, I'm also uh, working with him a little bit off and on uh, on the uh, open carry movement here in Tarrant County. Right. I, yeah, I wanted to get into that too. Yeah, the open carry movement down there. And uh, you're around DFW, right? Yes, yes, I'm in the DFW area. I am a uh, delegate and a precinct chair with the Libertarian Party. So I get to um, meet a lot of cool people in that area as well. Um, and one of them was uh, Corey Watkins. So, uh, and this is funny because my uh, children say his name with a British accent, and it's pretty fascinating. <laughs> anyway, so Corey Watkins is um, <laughs> basically the leader. Um, well, he does not want to. He does. He asked me not to say that he's the leader, but he's uh, basically the face of the movement. It's, a de we're, um, it's decentralized. Yeah, it's decentralized, and uh, so what we do is, you know, we go and march, and basically here in Texas, I can go bike riding with my kids with my AR-15 and my on my shoulder, and it's perfectly legal, perfectly beautiful. It has a magazine inside, all nice and dandy, but if I happen to, you know, be mowing my front yard with my, you know, S&P, M&P 40, you know, I can get shot. So it's kind of silly that people are afraid of handguns, but... I can run around with my AR-15. So what we're bringing the awareness of is uh, letting people know that you know it's legal and it's fine, and people are not going to kill each other. So you know he goes to Target and he goes to Kroger, and we do marches and just to bring awareness on that fact. Um, you know, I I did live in Texas um, basically the whole time I was in the army, other than deployment, and uh, so I do know what it's like, what, what what how firearms are treated down there. Um, JB and I are both in New England. He's in Massachusetts, and I'm in Rhode Island now. And if I try to open carry, which I can open carry a long gun legally without a, a permit or anything, but if I do that, I'm likely to be killed, I think. I'm at least likely to be detained, legally see my weapon illegally seized, and probably, I don't know, melted down or sold, and definitely do a weekend at, at least. And this is Even Rhode Island. Legal? Yes, yes. Um, and if JB did something like, well, I don't even think he could buy a gun, to be quite honest, but <laughs> if he tried to do something like that, it's, it's going to be flamethrowers and burn pits, man. I That's need to, pretty crazy. I need to get background checks, seven-day wait, and, and pass a certain test to even own a rifle. Yeah. Wow, and that's oh, yeah. that's true for Massachusetts. I think um, there might even be more re uh, restrictions. There well. are. I mean, for me, and and I know where JB is. It's worse. But for me, in order to own a pistol, I need to do everything that I just said with an additional background check and get this funny little license that's called a blue card, which is a license to own a pistol. In order to carry concealed or open to carry a pistol you have to get a shall issue permit, which basically the only way you're going to get that in Rhode Island is if you are a cop. Well, that kind of sucks. I mean, you guys should come to Texas here. I can, you know, I have my, you know, tactical shotgun in my car, you yeah. know, and like the AR and then, you know, the other little fun yeah, fellas that I have Aside here. Aside from on army bases, I used to drive around with a Kalashnikov AK-47 in my car, man. Like, I know what tex what's up with Texas, but... Come to Texas. I'm, I'm thinking New Hampshire myself. But it's cold. <laughs> yeah, it's cold. <laughs> I'm going to be moving to um, New Hampshire in the summer, uh, and it's actually only 10 minutes away from where I'm sitting right now. What town? Uh, Nashua. Na yep. Did yeah. you watch The Office? Yeah. You remember Holly? No. <laughs> she it's marries Michael Scott? Come on, man. No, it's been a long time. All right, Just let me down left and right, guy. <laughs> um, um, I want to touch on your job a little bit, your day-to-day, -day, okay. your 9-to-5, and maybe your family life. Okay. Um, so um, three minutes on each. I, um, Be I am Better yet, more direct question, how does anarchism or libertarianism apply to both? 
Okay, cool. Yeah, um, basically I'm a consultant and what we do is uh, teach basically leadership development. But then, you know, you may say, well, whoop de doop what the hell is up with that? <laughs> so what we do is we, um, probably some people may be able to connect with this conscious capitalism from John Mackey. He wrote a book on that and basically what he says is bringing... Um, you know, using business as a form of uh, empowering people. So instead of like, we help people understand that they really cannot control others. So basically what we teach uh, directors and supervisors and managers is that their job is not to babysit and to tell people what to do, but turn the pyramid upside down and to become the support and to remove blockages and barriers for the frontline people. So by doing that, it empowers the employees. It brings their heart and their mind aside from just their hands doing their work. So, and that also works in a point where the supervisor or director is able to focus on other things. So we move from uh, scarcity mentality, from corporatism, to abundance mentality or capitalism, free market, anarchy. And it, it also allows, you know, um, if they're having a good, like to be able to discover what they like from work and where they need to go and what they need to gravitate towards. And then they also have, you know, better wages and uh, opportunities to have um, more time at home. Um, so that's that's basically what we teach, and um, most of our clients are on the Forbes uh, 100's best companies to work for. Is there um, a specific demographic of companies? You know, we are so we have so like one of them is a mechanical construction one. You know, the guys that did the uh, Dallas Cowboys Stadium, mm -hmm. and then other one is a financial firm in Houston, and like a. a a power utility plant in California. So I mean, it, they're all over the place. We 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 try to empower as many businesses as we can, and but I mean, we're a team of five, so there's only so much time. Um, so we we're able to do this, and I mean, a lot of people say, yeah, I mean, you're gonna take forever to go all over the United States, but I mean, not true. You know, like that that fractals out and it's like such powerful work and there's more I mean the Forbes 100 best companies to work for all those guys use servant leadership which is what we teach you know instead of like see here's what um, something that I think it's pretty important the most successful people are those who help the most and in a free market society you're wanting to serve people so you can actually get benefit from that so we allow, we give people the awareness, again, back to awareness, that the more they serve, the more they'll get instead of saying, how much can I get? So basically kind of like Henry Ford said, like giving people more for a dollar than maybe how little I can give them for a dollar. So that's what we teach. And, um, and it's a win-win, you know, and even like this also brings a lot of cool things because it unites the right and the left. You know, the right, we know the right and the left, you know, like talking about environmental um, problems and social problems and all that, we bring them to, I mean, Whole Foods, those guys don't pay any less than $11 an hour, you know. So, I mean, way, way, way be above the um, monopoly from government saying how much people should get paid. So, and that, you know, here in the house, you also asked about that. So we... We not only homeschool, but we on school. Great, good. Um, and what we do is like, um, I, I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> so I am not going to, you know, I mean, there's times where like, okay, do you need to brush your teeth? Your mouth kind of stinks, you know, but from that to, you know, forcing them now, we negotiate. And actually my little boy was telling me, if I wash the windows, would you download such and such game on your iPad so I can play? So we teach them to negotiate, you know. So that's a pretty cool yeah, thing. They're, they're, they're it's for the state. Exactly. So instead of being afraid of me, you know, they're like, okay, I need to do this. Okay, I'm not gonna do it. Okay, I'm like, okay, if you don't do this, this is what's gonna happen. You know, you're not gonna borrow my iPad, or you're not gonna get to. I'm not gonna take you there because you're not doing this for me. Then why should I do that for you? And okay, well, then <laughs> it works, and we do it, and everybody wins.
That's brilliant. Um, yeah, and uh, my wife uh, stays at home with them for the most part, and uh, you know we do meet up groups and they go to museums. We have some um, memberships with uh, museums, and they go do handsome work, and then they stay in the house, and then they go places. So basically, they wake up when they want to, they eat when they want to, for the most part. Um, bedtime is kind of like, okay, dudes, I'm going to sleep, so nobody's going to take care of you. So at least go to your room and read, because I'm going to sleep. Um, aside from that, you know, um, we allow. Um, I'm going to probably give you just a quick tour. Um, sure. We would you know. That. We have like little painting going on, and my daughter's there. Can you see her? Where is she? Yeah, yeah. She's yeah, doing, yeah. Like, you know, she's doing her work there. Um, it doesn't matter what she does, every, even play is a form of learning. So, um, of course. I mean, we have a bunch of things that we are using, and I had to kind of clean up so I could do this uh, interview. Oh, but we, um, like, even my table that I'm on right now, you know, this table is what they use for um, all their work. So, you know, they have their bikes, and they do a lot of physical activities as well. So, it's kind of a, an interesting dynamic. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, that's great. I only just just learned what unschooling is uh, this past June, mm. and initially I was kind of put off by it. But my my best friend John, um, he pulled his daughter out of school, and he's unschooling now, and she's uh, she makes all of us look like look like rookie anarchists, to be honest. And she's <laughs> six years old, so yeah, yeah, and like these dudes, you should be like. They amaze me sometimes with the questions they ask, and that's because, you know, the curiosity, we let it run loose, and, like, they ask questions, and they see what I do, and they ask, and then, you know, it's such an organic, again, back to spontaneous order, you know, they see, they get to, like, instead of focusing a lot on the left brain, you know, passive, listening, just sitting, quiet, like, we get to explore, we get to touch, we get to see. And we also teach that in the corporate arena with, uh, I mean, you, you, it's funny because you see like CEOs playing with toys in our seminars that we teach. So we, we give them permission to play and go back to being childlike. And there's just one difference between being childish and childlike. I saw you. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I know it's time to go. So I thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Well, don't, don't leave yet. You know, we're going we're gonna to stay on for a sec. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, I appreciate it, Luis. Um, it, that was awesome. Well, let's um, give him the chance to to plug his his nine thousand projects. <laughs> well, thank you. Real quick, um, um, my baby is emancipated human. Um, Indeed. I you know again I have a North Texas Cup Log Cup Logic Anarchist in Spanish V is for voluntary black markets of are beautiful policing the police the dollar vigilante Bitcoin down the rabbit hole and Maggie Cooper and Associates Anarchist Español. Cowtown Libertarians, and that's it for now. Uh, my website, emancipatedhuman.com. I also write with uh, for Jeff's uh, newsletter, and I get to focus on expats. So if anybody's uh, wanting to leave the country, and uh, just hit me up, and we'll he hook you up with uh, some uh, second citizenship somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess um, that's it. I'm I'm happy to serve. So will we? Uh... Are we going to see you on the first Monday in January? He was telling me about that, and that's the fifth, and it seems clear, so I may be able to do it. I'll just um, I'll see how that one turns out, but yeah, I'll be happy I'll, if I I'll can. be sure to talk to you, and uh, we hope you can make it. If not, we know you're a busy guy, so no worries. Right, exactly. I so, appreciate you guys so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. And um, Michael, uh, who do we have on next week? Oh, we're going to try this again, right. Well, I, I bought a new router. Actually, I didn't buy it. Co my, my company gave it to us for free because they provide a terrible monopolized service. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, next week we have anarchist, atheist, asshole Chris Cantwell, who you guys might know as the enforcer from Stephen Colbert's Colbert Report. Uh, he's down with Free Keen. Um, He's he's up there in New Hampshire, you know, living the living the dream, doing doing the uh, the good stuff, activism and writing and trying to get healthy and all this great stuff. And yeah. no idea what we're gonna talk about next week, but he does basically a bit of everything, so it should be vulgar and informative. <laughs> right. Um, that is. Uh just for next week, and then I understand that you may have uh, booked Jeffrey Tucker. 
Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, yes. Uh, so the I, I think the twenty sixth. Don't quote me, but I think the twenty sixth of January is the final Monday, and Jeffrey Tucker fully confirmed he's going to be our guest. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. He's like I love that man so much. Uh, he was like my very very first interview, like I told you, and he's always so sweet. And every time I meet him, he's like Louise, and I'm like, oh, warms my heart. I love that That's man so awesome. much. My only problem with Jeffrey Tucker is that he he doesn't camp at Porkfest. Ah, oh, he gets a that's... hotel. <laughs> Dude, does that surprise anybody though? No, no, not me. <laughs> I I um, like hotels. <laughs> yeah, I, you don't seem like much of a camper either, bud. Well, uh, my wife is a very earthy person, so we get to camp often because okay. of her. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, if it was up to me, we would probably live in Shanghai or Mexico City. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much again. And, um, yeah, the next show is with Christopher Cantwell. That will be uh, December 29th live, uh, Monday night at 9. And um, this show tonight will be posted at VVN with graphics and all um, and that will be uh, the 24th uh, so Christmas Eve uh, Wednesday at 3 p.m. at VVN so youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues so uh, thank you all and have a good night you too bye guys be well peace love and anarchy <laughs> <laughs>